delighted to have our colleague, Dr. Gord Lovegrove here today, an associate professor in the School of Engineering in the Faculty of Applied Science at UBC Okanagan and Department Science Advisor for Toward and Infrastructure Canada for the Government of Canada. And his talk today is on transportation as a social determinant of health. I'm really looking forward to this, uh, Gord, and so I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Well, th thank you, Joan. And uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, whatever time or whatever time zone uh, you're watching this. My, my talk today, and it's provocative in the title, uh, I've heard this, I'm, this is not my words. This, this is actually uh, from a discussion group I've been on, uh, and I've heard it several times that transportation is a social determinant of health. So I think it's, uh, it's fitting to the form we have today. And I really would appreciate hearing your reaction to what I'm presenting, uh, not just questions, but reaction of what you think of this idea. The purpose of my talk is to give you hope for the future. We're coming out of a pandemic and uh, what next uh, is gonna hit us. So, so let's talk about what could be next uh, to help us thrive uh, as we go forward. And we're gonna, whether we like it or not, experience growth in our populations, in our visitors, in our businesses. How do we manage that in a way that uh, learns from around the world, from our successes here, there, as well as um, the challenges we've been facing and how we've handled it previously. So with that, uh, let me fire up the, whoops. Wrong, 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 wrong. There we go. There we go. There. That's what we're going to do. Um, my hypothesis is we can do better with what we have to sustain a desirable quality of life that promotes healthier, safer, and more prosperous Okanagan residents and visitors and businesses. And why I say that's a hypothesis is because I, I travel the world. Uh, that's what I do as a researcher. And I've seen a lot of things. But let's take a look at some motivations uh, happening locally and you could even make links to the world but these stats apply to us in Canada and, and locally as well. We really have issues around obesity called the new nicotine because we we drive a lot and we're uh, we need to be more active. Uh, second motivation is <clears throat> road crash injury is a leading cause of death in, in Canada. We could, we, we need to think about more choice, more, more active living and ways to uh, be safer in how we connect and how we get around. Um, we need to connect because social isolation is worse for our physical health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. As medical health officers across Canada have told us and researchers, um, we, we are, I'm an example <laughs> of an aging baby boomer. Uh, more of us are old as a percentage of our community. Uh, there's going to be more of us needing to connect, but how are we going to get around? Are we going to drive until we're 90? I actually have a father-in-law who's doing just that. He's a former truck driver. He's an amazing driver at age 90, but I'm probably not going to be him, I'm probably not going to want to drive and Greyhound's gone. So how are we going to get around and have access and equity? Um, we also have just in the last years, you appreciate huge storms wiped out our links to the coast. So we need community resiliency and we need that sense of community. Um, you'll notice there's highway and rail links here kind of connecting to my talk today. Uh, we also want to be able to, and this is again, uh, making reference to my family members, and I'm sure many of you feel the same way. We want to age in place. Why do we have to move somewhere when we get old or older? Um, but we still want to stay connected to our friends, family, and services that may not be in our community. Uh, not to mention affordability of housing, whether you rent, can you get a rental or even own? I mean, there's, there's currently lots of motivations to think about how do we grow in a smarter way and so my research team my smarter growth research team we look at we take a system a strategic level high level approach to the 
research on land use and transportation. So the check marks kind of speak to this. You can see the picture. We've had renderings of, of a smarter growth neighborhood. We have protected cores. You have parks within a minute of every door barrier-free walking and bike networks. You'll see there's no real shortcut routes for cars because it's meant to be safe for all ages, very young, very old, everybody in between, families and singles, and calmed roads. And this is the intent behind a smarter growth neighborhood, but that's nice if you're traveling locally. How do you get around regionally? What if you wanna connect, like I said, to those friends, family, or services that may be uh, aren't in your community, or maybe you come from a smaller community than what's shown on this graphic. So connecting at a regional intercity level is also very important. Um, oh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm saying this because uh, it, it's, we're not members of the Canadian club. We're now in the midst of a climate crisis. And I've mentioned previously on, on the resilient slides, uh, the, the severe weather events that are happening as a result, we have to reduce our emissions. And we know uh, on the left, transportation is responsible in the Okanagan Valley for the vast majority of those greenhouse gas emissions that are causing climate change. And we on the right are, I've seen the enemy and it's us, we drive too much. So just one last kick before I start moving into uh, passenger rail. And are you serious? Can we do that in the auto-oriented Okanagan Valley? Let's, let's give ourselves a shake and a reality check. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, I'm Next week, I'm traveling to the Netherlands to explore how they promote more sustainable communities. And in Europe and in China and all the tourism destinations of the world, uh, big, small, and everything in between, rail is used. And, uh, and perhaps not all of them, but in my mind, the most desirable. And we did a study in the Okanagan decades ago, the Okanagan Partnership actually, that said we need rail. So we've been talking about rail for a long time. How are we going to actually get it? what do we want our valley to look like in 30 to 50 years? And, and folks are saying, oh, can we afford it? But we have to stay connected. All those motivations are great. It's a great idea, but who's gonna pay and how can we afford it? Well, so we, we, we actually in North America, a freight rail is continuing to grow and more and more people are desiring to travel by rail if it's there. There's huge demand. We know this just looking at our cities, right? I'm not talking about in our cities, the big cities. Kelowna's got no sky train and we can't afford 400 million per kilometer. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about between cities and connecting that's in a more appropriate scale for smaller regional cities. And at the same time, not you know noisy, vibrating diesel. So how do we come to a zero mission? I call them zero mission or ZE uh, rail. And there's a lot of different ways to look at this. On the left with my cursor here, I'm pointing to something called a green goat. That happens to be something I'm researching on right now. Locomotives that carry freight trains or pull freight trains. Um, decarbonizing diesel. The other way is to look at fuel cells. And this can go for passenger rail as well as freight rail. And so that's where we've been focusing for a number of different reasons. Uh, there's <clears throat> overhead wires that's very traditional in, in Europe. It's extremely expensive though, and it can cause safety concerns for not just the people that maintain it, but folks that perhaps trespass, the leading cause of death on rail corridors is trespassing and, and, and road rail crossings. How do we deal with that? Um, of course, in North America, that's primarily because it's freight rails at, at higher speeds. So how do we deal with that? Um, discontinuous electrification, maybe we use batteries. CN right now is trialing something like that in Montreal and they use batteries and then they have to charge. Again, for long distances, not gonna work unless you have frequent charging, which takes hours. So again, it's impractical uh, where you have long, long distances. So Canada internationally and nationally has a hydrogen strategy. And so they are looking at hydrogen. Uh, it's safer actually uh, than conventional fuels. Uh, there's a great YouTube video, by the way, if you wanna see it, it's old, uh, comparing gas and diesel to hydrogen uh, fuel tank leaks and uh, the, the 
gas car basically burns to the ground and hydrogen is lighter than air. So it actually goes straight up uh, and it's it's a quick burn and it's uh, the car is left totally intact. Obviously the, the byproduct for hydrogen, by the way, it's one of the most plentiful ubiquitous elements in the universe, combining with oxygen creates water, H2O. Um, so when you combine it with oxygen, in other words, combust, you get heat, electricity, and water vapor. And for longer distances and heavier loads, it is the best um, fuel combined with a hydrogen fuel cell. Why it's the best among other things is there's multiple production pathways. It's not, doesn't all come from oil and gas industry. It can, that's called gray hydrogen. It can come from solar, wind, you name it, uh, hydroelectric and through electrolysis. electrolysis. It has about twice the power efficiency to diesel. Uh, it's, it stays in, it's, it's an energy carrier, what we say, and it, it stays until it's used, it stays, it's not like batteries, it doesn't run down in its energy efficiency, it stays intact as you store it. Canada is part of an international consortium uh, right around the world, moving to low carbon fuels and hydrogen is actually a zero carbon fuel. And the other thing that really needs to be considered is we need a way to transition to a low carbon or zero emission energy sector in Canada. And so that gray hydrogen I talked earlier about that can come from oil and gas, that is one way being looked at. Uh, the beauty of it is that uh, whether it's carried by rail or pipelines or produced trackside from you know solar panels next to the track, it allows for folks in the current energy sector to transition their job skills quite quite nicely. Of course, right now we got some short-term challenges. That's why I'm researching it. It's currently four times the cost of diesel, so it's about twelve to fifteen bucks, uh, the equivalent per uh, compared to diesel. Uh, and diesel, well, it's up at two, and and so for energy equivalency, it's 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 expensive. Um, it's also at high pressure. So sometimes you need compressors to compress it down or release it to operate at a, a pressure that works with fuel cells in combination. Those are things we're researching and solving right now. So in the next couple of years, you're going to see uh, hydrogen demonstrations happen. This is just a basic diagram showing the moving parts in a fuel cell. Uh, it's a controlled, I call it a, a controlled reaction to capture the free electrons of combining oxygen with hydrogen and through a permeable a membrane. So um, that's the link and this lecture is recorded. You can come back to it. Um, like I already said, uh, I'm researching around. This is actually a, just a quick snapshot of our CAD drawings of how we're going to set up our, our first hydro uh, goat uh, yard switcher for a freight train. But this presentation, we're talking more about this. Now you can see some writing on here. It's called the Coradia Island. So this train was formerly a diesel train. They're now, which emits noise and, and greenhouse gas emissions, not to mention particulates, which are carcinogenic. In Europe, it's been running since uh, 2016, zero emission hydrogen fuel cells with battery hybrids on board now. So the island is the zero emission version of what was formerly called the lint. And you can see here, it's uh, this hydro has been researched. Hydro is, by the way, uh, a contraction of the words hydrogen, fuel cell, battery, hybrid, rail, power. That's a mouthful. And I'm not going to say that 10 times. So we condensed it into hydrail. And we've, for over 20 years, we've been looking at this thing. And, and we are now working with SRY or Southern Road BC. Uh, CP Rail is, is also working on it in Calgary. So I'm working on it in BC with the Southern Railway of BC. Uh, there are others, uh, some research colleagues of mine that are working with the CP Rail in Calgary. And we're gonna see something in the next year. They've already actually put a, a fuel cell switcher together. And we're hoping now that we're gonna produce um, a fuel cell switcher in BC in the next year as well. And also bringing tra tram trains. So what's a tram train? Well, that's a tram train. And so what I want you to see 
is a video that it's now four years old, so it's out of date, but it gives you the idea of what we're talking about and allows you to listen to somebody. Well, okay, I'm in the video, but it allows you to listen to somebody else besides me on this whole idea. So let's, let's listen to this quick video. Okay, this is exciting. Dr. Gord Lovegrove leads research in both sustainable development and sustainable transport safety, which he says boils down to a basic idea. How do we sustain a desired quality of life, meet current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to do the same? One area that shows great promise and has long interested Dr. Lovegrove is hydrail or hydrogen powered railways. We have been researching hydrail and ways to convert our North American railway fleet from dirty, stinking, noisy diesel to clean, green, quiet hydrogen fuel cells for over 10 years. There are many advantages to hydrail, according to Dr. Hofrichter, a pioneer in the field. Railways have a significantly lower environmental footprint than transportation on the roads. Pairing that with hydrogen makes that an even stronger advantage as the energy that is actually being used for this transportation service is zero emission. Dr. Holger Busche, consultant to the German government on rail and environmental issues, says that making the change to a hydrogen fuel transportation system requires just a little imagination. So you have to make your vision how life could be with a train system, safe, quiet, not noisy with cars, um, and clean energy driven, cheap, you don't need an own car, no traffic jams, all that kind of stuff. Lovegrove's vision includes the construction of a hydrogen-fueled electric railway connecting the entire Okanagan Valley. The zero-emission lightweight trains require far less infrastructure than standard trains and could provide a myriad of benefits, from greatly reducing traffic congestion, pollution and deaths, to allowing affordable connection for those who can't or choose not to drive all at a cost estimated to be far less than further widening Highway 97. We are addressing congestion, pollution, noise, uh, connection, aging in place, healthcare, socialization. Hydrail technology running the entire length of Highway 97 from the U.S. border up to Kamloops solves so many of our sustainability problems in this valley. Why not? One group that is eager to explore the possibilities is the Penticton Indian Band through their new cool economic development office. I think we're excited about being able to uh, participate in global innovation, leadership in climate change and bringing it to where it's going to make a difference in our neighborhoods and in our communities. With the Hydrail project as a catalyst, the band is now actively seeking to develop new clean industries, such as solar-powered hydrogen production and converting diesel rail to hydrogen power as part of building a sustainable economy. We've been working at a business case for the last five months in terms of cost of production and management and partnership. The groundwork has been laid out very well by Dr. Lovegrove and his team. This is a very exciting project. Um, the majority of the railway system in North America is freight-based. The opportunity that's offered here through UBC and the First Nation partners to decarbonize freight rail has huge potential and a big impact on the overall sustainability goals of society. Dr. Lovegrove says he's excited to see the results of his research sparking such interest. There's an economic incentive, there's a greenhouse gas climate change incentive. If Canada wants to remain competitive, we need solutions, we need to provide clean rail technology. And that's the mandate driving our hydro research. All right, there you go. Okay, this and it is, as I said, out of date, and it talks both freight and passenger. At this presentation, I'm focusing for the rest of it, obviously, on tram train or passenger rail. And you'll notice uh, in those diagrams that they use embedded rail. So key here is embedded rails in a road. Um, we're not talking a freight train corridor. We're talking barrier free where you can walk and you're not tripping over rails. And, and these things allow for connection. They allow for route flexibility uh, wherever you want the stations, you full consultation with communities. And so it is barrier free, route flexible, and a, a lot less expensive, roughly half the cost of widening the highway, 
uh, or new highways. If communities want it, uh, basically, where do you want it? it it's, it's subject to consultation right across the board. There is no concern over can it go up a hill around a corner? It can go up any hill. And this has been proven by what, us looking at similar technology worldwide uh, and around any curve that Highway 97 goes. This this is why I say it's reflexible. Most people say not in my backyard because they don't want the route there. Well, you know what? It's up to your community to have a consultation and agree on where it's going to go. Not my job. <laughs> I'll, I will make it work for you. Uh, and, and it does bring all sorts of opportunity, right? Uh, income, jobs, uh, housing, more housing, revitalized transit, it becomes the backbone, right, of connecting the valley. So um, th that's why I call it smarter growth. You got to improve livability, accessibility, congestion crashes. And of course, uh, we don't all have to drive. We can actually enjoy the view for once. So uh, it's not, let me I really need to underline this. Folks look at this. Oh, LRT. Isn't that SkyTrain or 250 per mile or more now? This is an old stat. I should have updated it last night when I put this together. Uh, it's not noisy diesel or, or emitting polluting diesel. And it's not a panacea. We're talking about providing choices. You saw a 30% estimate. That's typically in my experience traveling worldwide and planning these both in Vancouver and, and across the world, uh, a low estimate of how many shift out of their cars onto this. Uh, we, we did full sensitivity tests on, you know, was, could it be lower, could it be higher? And what would that mean uh, to show that there is an economic case and it's feasible now? Of course, it takes time to get this. So I wanna start the discussion ASAP and connect our valley and reconnect, right? Coming out of, like I said, post pandemic. Let's drill down just a little bit deeper. So between cities, it would travel at highway speeds, either beside the highway in the median of the highway. Key is that it's route flexible and, and we would have full engagement with all stakeholders, highways, provincial highways, local communities, and folks to decide where's best. So this is this is an example of a tram train. Uh, I believe this one's in Germany, and then here's another one. Uh, not, uh, I'm uh, might be France, but I'm gonna I'm, I forget where I got this one from. But this is in a city, and it operates like a tram. So this is uh, actually something called the Karlsruhe model. Tram trains in Karlsruhe are basically LRT vehicles that also run outside the city. So they are trams in the city and then they operate on regional tracks between cities. And that's why it's called the Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe tram train model. First used there and now it's happening all over the world. Um, it eliminates the need for overhead wires when we get hydrogen on board. So the aesthetics work can essentially be put anywhere, you've got the ability to, to put the stations and the rails. It is economically feasible now. We've researched this. Uh, they, we do uh, see a, a total cost. So we're talking big money, but look at the cost of a second crossing. It's at least half a billion or 500 million. Uh, it's 10 to 20 million per kilometer. Um, estimates of the whole project cost, Vernon to, or I should say, you know, Soyuz to Kamloops, whatever you want to call it, to meet forecast travel demand is high. We've got uh, that versus one and a half billion. And these are us doing our economic analysis with lots of, you know, flexibility and error analysis and all sorts of deeper engineering tech technology and analysis in accord with what's normally done on a on a big project like this. So we use all the latest methods. Uh, we've got a paper we're about to publish on this. So we're going through peer review to make sure our peers agree with us. And the bottom line is, if this thing truly over the next 20, 30 years is going to save us billions of dollars for taxpayers, where and how, just think of the potential to apply those where it's truly needed, you know, more affordable housing, our, our overdose, our addictions, uh, our support of our social programs, uh, supporting our tourism, uh, fire safe, all the issues we've talked about, connecting people. So um, I think it checks all the boxes. And how are we doing for time here? Oh, we're doing great. So these are just some, I've been presenting this and discussing this in various forms, locally, regionally, provincially, and also nationally in my role of, as departmental science advisor with the chief science officer. And I, I just tell you that transport 
2030 is the federal strategic plan, but the city of Kelowna has a strategic plan to connect uh, the regional district central Okanagan. Their intent is to connect and help and BC transit and the province has its climate BC uh, plan. So, so when I talk about climate action 2050, that's basically the federal plan, but you could also talk about clean BCs. 2040 2050 net zero plan uh resilience we've already talked about how you know we're probably in the next week or two we're going to get into the heat uh, and then you're going to see a drought and then you're going to have the spring freshet which causes floods and fires and then uh we we're actually talking about have all your parties now because july august we're going to see the smoke roll in i hope not but going forward if we can reduce our emissions and use rail to help us in that regard. I think there's huge positives to aging in place, access to services, social connection, reducing congestion, and also allowing our tourism to, to boom. When you think about the access of not just visitors to our community, but also workers in our tourism industry having better access to housing in adjacent communities or around stations, Etc. So there's all sorts of positives to this. And, and I think what I'm going to do there is that's, that's about 30, 35 minutes in. I, I have lots more slides behind this, folks. And I've seen, I'm seeing comments. And I'm just wondering if, if we could um, move to questions and answers. I've got, there's lots of time left. So, so Joan, over, over yeah. to you. I think we could. There are some comments and questions. I think we could have a really great conversation about this. So, uh, Virginie says she loves this, so that's great. Thanks, Virginie. Um, another comment, the logical location would be the rail trail. How do you displace the cyclists and the walkers, or do you? Uh, no, it's interesting. That is an option, but again, we haven't discussed this. I think the community needs to come together and talk about what they want. I mean, right now, uh, the city's talking about a road extending Clement from Spall all the way through to, is it McCurdy? I can't remember how far, right alongside the rail trail. So um, I don't know if the word is, uh, I, I, I certainly am very uncomfortable with that. I love riding the rail trail and I like it because it's quiet and I don't have to worry about anything but listening to the birds and watching out for the bees as they fly across me. So that's one option. As I said, it can go along Highway 97 in the median. It's quite, in fact, very wide through Kelowna uh, and all the way up uh, to to uh, Vernon. Uh, yes, you could use parts of it, but not, not, not a requirement. Absolutely not a requirement. Don't want to display cyclists and walkers. No. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. Thank you very much. So when you show pictures of it along the road, are those rails put in existing roads or are they off to the side of the road and you expand the road a little bit to take to accommodate the rail? How does that how does that actually See, this work? Is exciting. This okay, I'm actually gonna try and get back to that diagram if, if this will let me. Okay. Uh, oh, there it is. Sorry. Let me let me just go back. So yes, so you're you're talking about, for example, this picture here. Yeah. In in cities, this would go in the HOV lane. So in, in Kelowna, right? There isn't an HOV lane in Vernon, but uh, it doesn't, you don't have to have an HOV lane. This is common practice. If folks go to Europe, I'm, I'm like I said, I'll be there next week. This is a tram operation, low speed, city road speed, okay? So this is really important that we embed the rails in the existing road it shares traffic and the video showed it coming, for example, over the bridge. Same idea. This is this is why it's called light rail. You can put mm -hmm. anywhere you've got trucks running. It's it's not it's not an overburden on any road structure. And, and that's the cost. The major capital cost is digging up the road uh, surface, grinding it down to embed the rails. Right. Right. And so this rail, whatever we call it, this train. Tram train. Would, yeah, tram train would then be uh, follow the same road rules that all the cars do. Exactly. Right? Just like they do in Europe, low speed and, and uh, running with traffic. So, and for, let's take the bus, for example, right now. So it connects from West Bank to UBC, right? Uh, mm -hmm. this, this would be in that similar vein. And that bus... Uh, from the Queensway bus stop, I take it 
25 minutes out to UBC roughly. And that's an average speed over what, 15 kilometers. So, you know, 30 kilometers an hour, just rough mm -hmm. math in my head here. It's, it's not a high speed in a city and it's not even high speed between cities because what are our speed limits? 80, you know, it, it keeps up with traffic. It's not meant to, it's not meant to uh, exceed speeds or go any high speed. It's meant to just provide a local uh, service in cities. Right. So Sue asks, and this is a good question as well, given our climate and especially in the summer when it's very dry, will this transmit transit emit sparks on the rail line? And of course, I think she's worried about obviously fire. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hear you loud and clear on that question. That would be a concern. And, and I was involved uh, last, was it June or was it July when, when Lytton had its its mm -hmm. uh, unfortunate fire. Uh, they they investigated it, and I say in theory, striking metal on metal, absolutely. But that's a hammer on an anvil. This is a wheel rolling over the the metal, Sue. So, uh, in in terms of a sudden strike, so if there was a broken wheel, you'd probably get sparks. Um, there's no stacks on here. Uh, that's the other concern you should raise is sparks from the particles that diesel mm -hmm. emits, right? So, so no, I'm going to say in the vast majority of cases, but theoretically sparks are possible, but so are, and you've seen them, we've all heard about, you know, uh, even Tesla, which is just a battery, had a fire yesterday, I read on Castanet, was that Kamloops? I can't remember what it was, but trucks coming up the Coquihalla Hill um, on our highways, vehicle fires happen all the time. The, the idea of sparks from these wheels, uh, it's, it's theoretically possible. I'm not going to say no, but it's, it's not part of the normal operation. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Sue. Thanks so much. Yeah, that is a good question. So, you know, I guess my wonder, I wonder about, I know these are available in other places, and I'm wondering if you've seen this kind of um, transportation system in communities that are like ours with about the same size population, you know, a few major centers spread apart um, like we have, have they been used in kind of similar settings as opposed to, you know, big urban settings? This is a really core question. Thank you so much, Joan, for asking that. I remember uh, when I first talked about this, the uh, local radio folk were, uh, they had talked to me and then they asked a, a rail, uh, another rail person. And the, the word that came up and what you're speaking to, Joan, is density. Does this make any sense outside a major urban area? Well, you know, it's interesting. They spend billions and, as I said, 250, 400 million per kilometer, whatever it is, on SkyTrain, you know, elevated 15 meters in the air and things like that. Um, this might look like SkyTrain, but we're not talking, you know, 250, 400 million. We're talking 5 million per kilometer, like one, about a 100th, mm -hmm. you know, 50 to 100 times cheaper for good reason. Uh, and, and it can be done at that price, and that's one of the peers that I've actually had reviewing our research, because when you talk about surface rail, that, that's, that's the cost essentially of laying a, a common cost of, of freight rail tracks, mm -hmm. okay? So these tracks, so given it's such a low cost, your, your bar for justifying it, it's, it's not about density in, in rural areas. I mean, Kelowna's density is like a rural residential community. We don't have the density for SkyTrain. That's not even the argument for this thing. The argument is the tourism, it is the uh, connection. So a lot of social benefits that, you know, afford access, more affordable access to housing so that you can age in place to get to your medical services and other social benefits to it. And it, it, it offers more choice because in, in, in I, I don't know, how the rest of you viewing this have come to be in Kelowna, whether you're born here. I, I moved from Vancouver where I had choices, walk, bike, bus, sky train, drive, uh, carpool, uh, stay at home. I'm basically if, if, coming to Kelowna. I car shared. I actually had to buy a car. 
I had car shared in Vancouver, came to Kelowna. We're very auto oriented. Our planning, we're sprawled, we're, we're spread out. And that's, that's actually, it's interesting that that low density is a driver for something like this, because if we're growing older as a community, so the, the majority of us are growing older, plus our young people in our service industries that provide us coffee at Timmy's or AW, when we have our coffee chats on Thursday mornings at 8 a.m., they need somewhere to live. And mm -hmm. we don't have that. So, so the connecting of our communities up and down the Okanagan Valley, absolutely, this makes sense. And in fact, the world leader on tram trains, uh, surprise, surprise, comes from Germany. Karlsruhe is a city in Germany, and their name is Deutsche Bahn. DB is the initials. If you look at, up them, uh, Deutsche Bahn literally means German rail. So just look it up if you want to Google it. I should have probably included their logo on here. They have on their own, and there's other engineering consultancies, they've done the vast majority of tram trains around the world. Uh, many in Europe, they're now looking at Taiwan, they're looking at South America. So Taiwan's perhaps high density. South America is very similar to ours. The island Caradia, one of the first uh, besides Karlsruhe tram train in Germany, the tram train uh, island Caradia, that's in a low density rural valleys, valley. So um, I'm gonna just type in Google, uh, the Alstom Island Coradia. Are you putting that in the chat? I am. There you go. And so let that it go is... to everybody. Did it go? Oh, to sorry, my bad. Oh, sorry. No, I... uh, maybe Jaquetta can copy it out. Okay, her. thanks, Jaquetta. So that video, which is also a few minutes long, take a look at where it's running, and it's a low density rural German valley, and you, well. I told you already, but I, I challenge you to figure out what's different from the Kelowna Okanagan Valley. And this indeed, uh, my, my Deutsche Bahn colleagues and I were just literally talking about this uh, a week ago yesterday about tram trains and where they're going next because they're, they're, they're on their own. They've got over 20 projects uh, around the world, Europe included. They're, like I said, moving now with tram trains into South America, again, lower density, but connecting rural uh, low density communities. It, it's, it's the way of the future to provide that equi transport equity, social equity, access and access to healthcare. And that's why, you know, the title of this talk is transportation is a, is a social determinant of health. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's a really long winded answer. I apologize. No, that's okay. That's great. Um, Virginia has a comment here. The amount of folks that would benefit from this health, from a health perspective would be amazing too. There are a large number of folks outside of Kelowna area that have to come to KGH for procedures and have a very high, very limited transportation options. And I would argue, especially challenging in the winter, this would be a literal lifesaver for many of our folks negatively impacted by the social determinants health and, dra and drastically increase access to health. And yes, I would agree. And also patients who need to come to the uh, cancer center as well as KGH, I would argue. Yeah, I might have to, I, I just want to forward this if I can. I, I want to go back and I, I want to ask folks to um, reach out to me because one of the questions I have in my, I'm an engineer, obviously, if you haven't figured that out. I would ask you to, uh, after the seminar follow up or maybe in the response to the evaluation of this seminar, I'm really eager to connect with social uh, scientists and culture change experts because I see this, I mean, I live in the Okanagan Valley. I've experienced it personally and comments like this, Virginia, thank you so much. I agree a hundred percent, couldn't agree more. Um, I see this across Canada in my role with the federal government uh, to transport Canada and oops, did I just hit something? Uh, and, and so I would ask if you have the, ability to give me advice like I'm an engineer and I'm I'm I absolutely I'm looking for research collaborators but also one thing I've learned from a little bit of social marketing let's call it that uh, in my MBA that I've done is culture change requires a critical mass 20 25 percent of people to start thinking and pushing and a coalition of support 
to help that push continue to maintain that momentum. And it, it really talks, you know, at my role to the deputy ministers, I'm pushing. I'm, I'm in fact, I've been hired explicitly in a, what's called a challenge role. I'm external and I'm, I'm brought in to help federal staff think outside the box. And, you know, researchers typically are tree huggers or shall I say voices in the wilderness looking 10, 20, 30 years ahead. That's what researchers do. And that's why it's called research. Hey, this is a good idea. But in this case, I'm an applied researcher as an engineer. So I'm looking at around the world ways growth has been managed smarter. And that includes this new tram train technology, which actually is 15 years. It's not new. It's demonstrated. What's new about it is the zero emission aspect that the last five years has now gone into commercial service. I want it to get to Canada, not just for our valley, but right across Canada to give choices and equity and access and that thriving health uh, environment that we all need. And more importantly, think about one other thing that I haven't actually explicitly stated, I'm going to jump on it now, is think about our Truth and Conciliation, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and our 94 calls to action for especially our Northern rural communities, most of which are Inuit, First Nation, Indigenous peoples and communities that have limited, and it's usually seasonal, access, right? It's not year round. So you're right, Joan, your comment about uh, year round, you know, winter access, uh, you could apply that to our north. And we have stubs of rail and roads up to pretty well the northern borders of BC, Alberta and Manitoba, but nothing connecting them. So you can't connect between those communities. You just go up there and then hopefully you fly or you take a boat in Hudson's Bay when it's thawed or, you know, drive hopefully not in a blizzard, it's, it's treacherous traveling to our north. And those are also low density, but they have huge supply chain challenges, even worse than what we've got down here. We have supply chain now, more or less coming out of the pandemic and the tragedy that's happening across Europe caused by it, but it's even exponentially worse accessing our north. So to me, I see this as compared to what we do now, my brother-in-law actually flies people in to Winnipeg from uh, none of it and, and, and all the Northern communities, one and two at a time, extremely expensive, can't do it in the winter. How do you get folks up there that want to age in place or connect them? It, it is a real challenge. So again, looking at a system, this is just one zoomed in look on our Okanagan Valley. And there's other communities that I'm in touch with out of Chilliwack, Vancouver Island that see this as a perfect fit and there's there's advocates growing, groups growing. So again, a, just a call out, if folks contact me, I would love to see if we can work together to get this uh, on local government agendas or I, I don't know, um, I'm, I'm open to advice. Please help me uh, move this forward because we need this discussion at all levels, bottom up, and I'm looking at it from top down as well. I, I certainly, I don't pretend to know it all. I just think I have some proof it works elsewhere. Why can't it work in our Okanagan Valley? So sorry yeah. about that, but uh, that, that was a great comment. Thank you so much, Virginia. So from what you're saying, it seems like it hasn't been this technology or these um, tram trains haven't really been used anywhere in Canada to date, the hydrogen. Then. Correct. Yeah. No, these... These, um, so all, the good news is you're right. The, uh, sorry, the bad news is you're, you're right. The good news is Alstom, who uh, I think, uh, Jack Cata, you, you shared with folks, um, mm -hmm. bought out the Bombardier uh, rail car factory in Quebec. So now the folks that successfully did the first one have a rail car factory in Montreal or Quebec somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where. I think it's Montreal. Maybe I'm wrong. And they could produce these. Uh, there's also another company called Stadler, again, mm -hmm. from Germany, uh, and as opposed to Alstom, which is French. They're, they've got a, a factory in Utah. So actually, uh, California, Cal, Cal State is working on obviously high-speed rail, but they're also looking at this technology for regional intercity rail at lower speeds. So absolutely. Oh, well, great. So we could even build our own trains here. Well, that's the intent. We're, we're yeah. doing the enabling research. We've actually been approached by the National Research Council. They, they are now part of our research collaborating team to 
make sure it's all done safely, right? The, the, the research question for me is fuel cells are made in Burnaby. I mean, Ballard Fuel Cell has been around forever. Their largest customer, however, is China. We got nothing happening in Canada because we have cheap hydroelectric power, right? So mm -hmm. fuel cells are great uh, where you have coal like you do in China that are used for uh, creating electricity. Uh, so we're going to that's where Ballard sells to. Um, we we have uh, local, uh, what's called hydrogen in motion, a lo another local industry in BC that look at lower pressure storage. Remember I talked about those challenges maybe way back at the start of the lecture about some short term challenges that we're overcoming. So we, we have range extending hydrogen, low pressure hydrogen storage technology that is going to allow for longer trips between refills and the US government, Department of Energy has what's called the hydrogen shot to reduce the cost of hydrogen. So all of these by 2030 solved. Um, our project with Southern Railway BC is gonna be the first demonstration project using low pressure storage from hydrogen motion in Burnaby. The, uh, uh, it's it's an offshoot of Ballard called loop fuel cell. So we'll have local fuel cell, local hydrogen storage. The only thing we haven't got yet, and yet there are now researchers that, colleagues of mine at UBC in Kelowna, as well as a local um, um, Azimuth solar products in Kelowna. They're going to supply batteries. So we've got all these local industries going like, yeah, this is where we need to go. And we're here and, and they've, they're have they equipped. They have expertise to do all this locally. And Joan, you're bang on. We, we could produce these cars in Canada. I think first we're going to have a demonstration in the next year or two of a system integration because all of these things are on the shelf integrating the systems the research question, demonstrated with National Research Council certification that it's safe. And everything individually is, it's just when you combine batteries that sometimes get warm with hydrogen tanks, which, you know, if, if anything gets punctured, it will cause a fire and explosion, but thank God, you know, hydrogen goes straight up as opposed to natural gas or, or diesel fuel or gasoline, which pours down upon the ground and into the creeks. Uh, hydrogen is straight up and it's it's not a polluting fuel and obviously combines with the air and creates water anyway. So all, all of that to say uh, it's, it's very soon we're going to have a demonstration hydrail vehicle that, and Alstom can simply bring their European technology to, to Quebec. That's not an issue. This those cars could be produced now if they so choose. Uh, these multinational conglomerates sometimes uh, they're profit in form. So we're we're trying to push the research agenda and share it uh, with open science, so to speak, to CP Rail, CN Rail, and other manufacturers to to say that uh, as opposed to proprietary, profit motivated businesses, we want this to be shared widely. Yeah. So Dina's got a comment. Great ideas. <laughs> Dr. Lovko, <laughs> transportation planning is a key to solving many social, economic, and environmental issues. Thank you for the valuable lecture. I would agree. Uh, lots of great ideas here. And so I guess the question to you then is, how long is it going to take to get it in place? Do you think? Okay. What's your best it's guess. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, from my project engineering background, um, so for about 20 years, I, I was a, a project engineer for various cities and large and small projects, national, provincial, and, and municipal. <clears throat> and what I've seen is you can spend about $200 million a year. So if this project was, did I say a billion and a half? Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be five to seven years if you use that old just, you know, generic principle. Um, the planning is the, the longer. I would say you're talking five years. Just it's like herding cats. You've got communities from the border up to Kamloops, right? So, mm -hmm. so we look. We got at the feds, the province, the regions. Uh, we have First Nations, unceded traditional territory of silks. You saw Chief uh, Ennis. He has actually been uh, subject to. I guess there's a new chief with the Penticton Indian Band. We are working with them to reboot and, 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 and confirm they still want to be part of and lead this research. So it, it's really all stakeholders, residents, governments, 
indigenous, First Nations at all levels. And as I said, I'm gonna say it again, there's only one taxpayer. We, we have to do this smartly and, and, and we can learn from others. I mean, uh, a really interesting parallel. I'm mean, just draw this and I know our time's getting short here, but let's just go back to the 1880s where the government of Canada uh, barely existed and they had no money. They had land, much of it as well, unseated. So didn't have a lot of great stakeholder consultation engagement, but they knew they had to connect coast to coast. Well, they went around for five, 10 years before they found business uh, group out of, I think it was Britain that agreed, okay, we will build this for you if you give us land and, and some cash. Well, Canada couldn't afford. So they gave them every, every time they, I think they built five to 10 kilometers and I, it might've been more, but look at Pierre Burton, the last spike, Pierre Burton, great author, as we all know, great Canadian author, the last spike. And they gave them cash of, I think it was a million dollars per mile built plus an acre for every mile built. So every, 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 sorry, I said that wrong. They gave them every other mile, they gave them land adjacent to the track. And I think it was like 15 million acres and $15 million at the all, all said and done when the, when the, transcontinental in Canada was completed. So we have communities in the Okanagan Valley and provincially and federally as, as well as First Nations. They have to decide, do we want this thing first of all? And I'm saying, well, the case is made. You just have to decide, number one, do you believe it? Do you trust it? Get the critiques in there, uh, do you tweak it, challenge the numbers, do anything you want. We've kind of been doing all that, but please take a look at it. Assuming yes, then where do you want this thing? And do you want a station in your community? The way a private business group, like the one that built 150 years ago would approach is, well, what's in it for us? I say it's the station redevelopment, the housing, the, the business, the office to, to realize, uh, to develop each station, you get opportunity to develop housing. We all need housing. So work with development community. We got to get them to the table too, right? And they would also have part of a uh, typical public private partnership agreements, look at a 30 year, like our floating bridge in Kelowna was done with the provincial government, right? Uh, same idea, there's going to be fares collected. And, and that's how it works is, is no one government level can afford the heavy lift of a billion and a half. But we have a pension fund, uh, Alberta Public Servants Pension Fund. Uh, pension funds are always looking for good investments that can track with inflation. Well, Alberta, just a bad example or good example, they've invested in toll roads in Peru. Why, why couldn't they do something in the Okanagan Valley where our fares also increase with inflation? Uh, station redevelopment is an opportunity. There's, there's ways that people smarter than me can make this work in, a, in what's called a public-private partnership or a P3 uh, environment that would be attractive so that it could be affordable to all levels of government. And instead of this massive upfront multi-billion dollar cash flow, it's spread out over 30 years. You know, just take that number. So, so it, it, we have been looking at this every way from Sunday to see how there's a business plan behind it. We have you know, world leading business plan experts working with us on this. And we, we think it actually holds water. That's great. As a follow-up, there's a question here uh, about the governments, the governance and political willingness to carry out the project that would involve Indigenous, municipal, regional, provincial jurisdiction. You just spoke about that. You didn't really talk about the governance of it so much. I think you talked a bit about the willingness, political willingness is needed among all those stakeholders. And who would be the sponsor of the project? Yeah, actually, it's interesting. Uh, the, the first question there, I just read it while you were speaking. And the, the, the idea, I, I actually think we need a culture change. Th this technically makes good sense. Economically makes dollars and cents. Uh, socially has benefits unbelievable. It is a absolutely way to, for us to thrive. But when it comes to the decision makers, how do we make it happen? And I think uh, we have a lot of leverage if we look to our Indigenous 
uh, communities and as equal partners, nation to nation partners to be the authentic voice. They were here long before us and uh, they are stewards that can be mm -hmm. trusted. And I think uh, that's why it was really a privilege and honor to me when the Penticton Indian Band stepped up and actually approached us and said, we want, we agree with your research. We want to support this research and sign an MOU. So we're waiting for them, uh, but we're open to others coming forward to help us with this. This is a culture change. I mean, the, the first point's a sad point, but the Dutch government, uh, if I could talk to that as a world example, which is why I'm going there. And every year, every June, if you want to come with me, come. I, it's, it's, it's a course I teach, but it's also, I have community leaders, planners, engineers. Uh, I had the Penticton Indian Band chief as well. They, the Dutch government have done it where regional governments get together and then they create an arm's length, kind of like a crown corporation, where the government specifies service levels and they set up the cash flow, like I said, over that 30 year. That is the best example I've seen. Now, I, I suspect Deutsche Bahn and the, the German railways are another really good example. They're world famous for being on time. Uh, those are where I've seen these tram trains happen. I'm actually going to be traveling to Karlsruhe next month in Germany, spelled K-A-R-L-S-R-U-H-E as well to see the first tram train in operation and talk to their my colleagues there and, and uh, community leaders and how it worked. It is a culture change. Europe uh, has a, a, what is it? A union of 23 uh, countries. They have a, they share a common air shed. Uh, air quality is critical. Their, their, uh, their energy systems, critical. They, we, we have wide open spaces. This is the thing. Unless it, we can close that communication loop to appeal to our personal, some might say selfish interest, um, you're not going to see a lot of change. Well, guess what? We have smoke happening. We have extreme weather events happening, flooding, washouts, wildfires. People are starting to get the message. We got to do something different. And our governments are going to be called upon to help. A lot of people look at them to solve. No, actually, we need, it needs to be a partnership from the ground up. So uh, it is, there are good examples in the world I can speak to, but we really do need to go beyond that and be part of the solution individually all the way up to our government leaders. Great, thank you. Thanks so much as well to Pierre for those comments. Uh, and because I think you've addressed them, Gord, in terms of, of where there are good examples and uh, of both success and, and challenges. Um, I think we've almost run out of time, although I think we could have this conversation going on for quite a long time. It's obviously a topic that a lot of people are interested in, should be interested in, and lots of opportunity for people to get engaged in this conversation and, and perhaps advocacy effort. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we were the first uh, model uh, tram train um, in the country to really show the rest of Canada what could be done. Uh, Absolutely. Be what a fantastic. Now there's a vision, Joan. I'm with you. Are okay. you running for mayor? Are you going to run for mayor? No. I'm, I'm with you. I'm on board with you. <laughs> no. Anyway, but I, we do, on behalf of everyone who joined today and uh, the Institute, I want to thank you very much for sharing this research and um, hoping that some of our uh, attendees get on board with you and, and others who might be listening to this video afterwards. Uh, we will be posting it up on our YouTube video channel. So if you want to, you'll get a link and if you wanna share it with other people to, um, to share this vision, this idea for the future, uh, please I do, we welcome uh, as many viewers as possible. So with that, I want to thank everyone who attended and once again, thank Gord and wish you all a great afternoon. So